So welcome again, just the last session, and we'll try and uh, get you home on time. Um, again, um, just to make a couple of announcements, um, feel free to ask any questions. It's a pretty informal session. Uh, there are a couple of people that I'd like to just personally thank just for helping me facilitate this morning session and this session. Now, these sessions, as you know, from those who teach and educate, are very difficult to put together yourself. So I would like to really thank um, the Edwards crew, particularly Karen and Julie and, uh, and Kate um, and Sandy, for really um, allowing me to facilitate um, both workshops. Um, I certainly couldn't have done it without the support of industry, number one. Most importantly, um, it takes a very brave uh, colleague to offer your radial artery for, for a demonstration. And again, I usually put the arterial on in myself, um, and I've done that twice before, but I thought today I'm going to run a slightly different workshop. Um, so I'd really like to thank Claire Pollock, who's from Austin. <laughs> and as I told Claire earlier, I was quite disappointed with myself because um, I, I came very prepared, but um, I usually, if I'm quite nervous putting in an arterial line, if it's, um, I usually wire, um, and I left both wires in my hotel room, um, and then I put in um, um, the um, Surflow, which is a very soft cannula, and I transfixed and hit the artery first time and I was feeling more confident and as I pulled it back and tried to feed it it just got stuck at the skin because I didn't lick the skin so I really cursed and I wanted not to reattempt that side so I put in a first pass technique on the other side <laughs> <laughs> anyhow good so today's just really about a, um, a very brief introduction to looking at some physiological experiments um, Bearing in mind that we've planned this very carefully, um, obviously there are drugs involved. We've been very judicious and very concerted with how we've prepared them, um, and we've been through this a couple of times. So if anyone feels squeezy or, or squeamish, certainly just, just, just let us know. If Claire feels the same, she'll let us know. But essentially I've put in a straightforward arterial line into Claire's right hand. The monitor we're gonna um, demonstrate today, and often we use very different monitors, but this is um, um, a flow track, which is a minimally invasive advanced hemodynamic monitor. We have about eight of these in our hospital. I think they're very easy to use and very easy to demonstrate with, and we use them for a lot of our, um, our complex cases. So without further ado, I'm going to um, get the show on the road. I'm gonna set up the monitor just to show you how easy it is to set up. We'll put in a couple of demographic details. Um, is everyone familiar with advanced monitoring? Who has advanced monitoring in their departments? I know I've spoken to a couple of guys from, does anyone not, is, any, is anyone not familiar with the FlowTrack device? Um, it's similar to the Vigilayer. Okay, good. So, because I'm not going to, um, I'll, I'll keep the, I'll keep the, just the basic stuff quite, quite simple, and we'll move quite quickly onto the sort of the experiments. Um, but essentially, um, what we've done is we've slaved the device onto a big monitor just to give you more ac accessibility. Um, we'll put in um, our, our patient ID, um, and I'm just going to call it um, Claire, C L A R E. Um, and when they enter it, um, we'll put in a height. Clear. what's your height? 172. 172. We're going to enter it, and uh, she's 21 years old, uh, <laughs> and she's female. And we'll put a weight in of... Eight. Beautiful. Lovely. Okay, good. And we love working on 21-year-olds because they behave well physiologically. <laughs> I'm trying to make up points now, as you can hear. All right, good. <laughs> All right. Um, the monitor will take a couple of seconds to just um, <coughs> pick up the, the waveform and essentially... Um, so this is not zero as well. Okay? Yeah, correct, so correct, zero. correct. Um, and essentially there's a couple of different screens on, on the monitor. I always say everything's in the suitcase with a flow track, so if we go into the suitcase, because um, that's where everything is, we can see a zero waveform and just like um, um, zeroing er any arterial line, we're just going to go into zero and we're just going to zero. If you do have a central line in, which I did offer Claire, but she refused, we will be able, to, you would be able to slave off a mean arterial pressure, or sorry, a central venous pressure, and then obviously a systemic vascular resistance, which is quite useful. So that is uh, zeroed, and that is going to be now able to give us a good waveform. You can check the waveform. Um, you can check the waveform if you want by going back into the suitcase, and we can see we've got a nice waveform and it's quite, it's quite intuitive. I'm gonna set the screen up. There's a couple of different settings we can have, and I wanna show off the device a, a bit as well, because there's there's there is some functionality of the device that I think is quite useful. 
But as a start, we will, um, let's go into just a basic screen. Um, and in the basic screen, uh, we've got a cardiac index, we've got a stroke volume variation, bearing in mind that it's, it's not a very useful number here, and a stroke volume index. Um, it's very easy to change your parameters. If I want to look at a cardiac output instead, I just touch the side of the machine and change that to a cardiac output. Likewise, if I want to have additional screens or less screens, I can just change my, my, um, my, my screen setup. I've got a cardiac output, a stroke volume variation, a stroke volume index. If I want that to become a cardiac index, just to make it a bit more, I've got a cardiac index. And if I want my cardiac index up here, I'll make that cardiac index instead. So it's quite a, it's quite a functional screen. And as we can see, Claire's hemodynamic state is pretty normal at the moment. She's got a cardiac index, and we always go off indexes, and we don't look at outputs generally. Um, we've got an index of 4.4. We've got a stroke volume index. Um, I may just change that stroke volume variation to stroke volume um, of, of 120 mils per beat, which is pretty good. And we can see Claire's hemodynamics because one of the limitations of the flow track, it doesn't give you um, a pressure waveform tracing. Um, so again, we have to rely on basically a regular rhythm um, a good wave trace as well, which we have now, and we can see that Claire has a, a heart rate of 73 with a blood pressure of 147 on 71. So that's basically the setup, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward. The, the other thing I like, um, particularly with this device, is we do a lot of um, research both with the university and within our department, and whatever is on the screen, you can download immediately into a JPEG file, um, and it's a very simple, simple um, way by plugging in a simple memory stick, which I'll demonstrate now, because we're going to download some of the images. Um, it just plugs into the back of the monitor. And once the memory stick is in, by capturing, it takes a picture of that screen. So that image will be downloaded directly onto the memory stick. And most importantly, all the hemodynamic data that's collected, and this is collecting data every 20 seconds. If we often compare this to PA catheters for some of our, um, our clinical trial work. You can um, have it average the variables every five minutes, but for the purposes of today, I think having 20, second, um, 20 seconds is good. The other good thing with the flow track, and I'll just, I'm just gonna uh, do it as I talk, is I'm gonna tell it what we're doing, um, so it can download that information, um, and I'm just gonna go into, um, a screen uh, which again will just give me different trends and I can again change all my trends but I'm going to tell the machine now that and I'm going to do a custom event that we have got um, that we're starting our, our, our experiment here. so I'm going to just put start which is good uh, STA RT which is good and if you go exit that screen again we can see that where that arrow is we have got um, a start. So if you're going to intervene, you can, you can choose an intervention, blood, crystalloid, colloid, you can make a custom event, and the machine will tell you the change following an intervention. And we're going to run through that now and, and, and demonstrate it well. Okay, good. So I'm going to go back to our, um, and again, um, there's a couple of screens we can use, but for the purposes of demonstrating, I think let's go on to... Um, we're going to bring up our cardiac index, we're going to bring up our stroke volume index, and I think let's bring up just stroke volume um, variation, just for the point of having it there. Um, we can also set different parameters um, for each one, just by touching the middle, and I'm just going to leave the parameters as, as the default parameters. So it's a pretty intuitive machine, we can see our variables pretty nicely over here, and the question now is how does the machine function? Does it work? Um, we need to understand its, its strengths and we need to understand its limitations. From our own experience at Austin, we've been less impressed with the device for our complex liver transplant work in the, in the settings of vasoplegia. We still question some of the utility of, 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 and, and, and accuracy and precision of the device. Um, we have compared it to other devices, particularly PA catheters. Um, and sometimes for our complex cardiac work as well, um, particularly coming off bypass, particularly in, in vasoplegic states, it may have limitations. But generally, for a lot of our complex hepatobiliary work, our complex, um, our low-risk cardiac work, again, we've really defaulted to having some form of advanced hemodynamic monitor. And um, we're using um, our data, again, to see if our outcomes are being improved. And I'll present some of that data tomorrow during one of the talks. 
So let's start off by um, looking at Claire's basic hemodynamic state and seeing if she is fluid responsive. Now, a very simple way of ascertaining if someone is fluid responsive is by just having a look if their stroke volume um, increases in response to a passive leg raise. It's a very simple test. Um, it's, it's very... Um, it's, it's, it's non-sustainable, so if the patient's not fluid responsive, you haven't committed yourself to a drug or an intervention. Um, Claire had a good breakfast this morning. Um, not much alcohol last night, so I'm, I, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming her volume status is pretty good, but we can still go through and demonstrate um, what Claire's hemodynamic uh, response is to passive leg raise. But what I'm then going to do is I'm going to induce a state of compensated shock. Um, and I've pre-prepared um, pre a couple of syringes just to demonstrate how the body functions under different physiological conditions. I'm going to run a very low dose um, infusion of, 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 of GTN. GTN is a very powerful venodilator and essentially by venodilating and reducing preload we're going to induce a state of what I call compensated shock. Um, for our Longer workshops, we often venesect uh, four, five hundred mils of, of blood from from our um, from ourselves or from our um, um, Subject. subjects, um, and we've run a, um, we've run two animal workshops as well, and it works. The experiments are, are really good. So that's what we're going to do first or second. Then the plan is going to be to decide, and I alluded to this this morning, the best way to treat that um, hemodynamic state of of, of relative hypovolemia. And again, as I said to you earlier, traditionally we all think that fluids are the, co are the correct intervention, and they certainly are the correct intervention, and the hemodynamic response from fluids will be to correct that state. But I want to demonstrate also, and there's an emerging body of evidence that's now coming through the literature showing the effects of vasoconstrictors on um, venodilatation, uh, on, on venoconstriction. This is a fascinating area of, of research. We're doing a bit of it ourselves. But I'm going to demonstrate, hopefully, how we can achieve the same effects as fluid intervention using a vasoconstrictor. And you can do this with phenylephrine, with noradrenaline. I'm going to use aramine here because I think it's the safest in this context. We then will make clear, um, we'll put into a state of compensated shock again, and we'll have a look at the physiological response to fluids. And hopefully we'll show that the response is the same as, as essentially we're increasing preload just by a different mechanism. And then we're going to stress Claire's heart by running, um, like we do in our, in our cardiac lab, we run a little bit of um, dopamine for our, for, for our um, dubutamine or dopamine stress echoes. And I've, I've drawn up a very safe and, and low concentration of dopamine where we're going to try look at the effects of inotropy and chronotropy on hemodynamics. If we have time, we then can actually get Claire onto the bicycle because that's, a, again, a nice demonstration of of normal inotropy and chronotropy and have a look at a hemodynamic state following that. So that's going to be the sequence of events. Um, and we'll see if it, we'll, we'll see what happens uh, running it. So the first experiment is we're going to uh, have a look at Claire's response to passive leg raise. Now, as we said, what do you think is going to happen with, with, what do we expect in a patient that's quite well hydrated? What do you think Claire's response is going to be to passive leg raise? What would you normally expect? Yeah, correct. And again, uh, sometimes these experiments don't work well. Sometimes they work beautifully and they, and, and they follow the textbook. But what we can see from the monitor there, we've got a stroke volume, um, a stroke volume index of 61. Um, I may change our stroke volume variation just to a stroke volume, to those that are more familiar with stroke volume as well. And we've got our cardiac index in the middle. Stable hemodynamics, obviously not in theatre, so we're not in a bleeding state. I'm going to lift Claire's legs up and just try to rest them in my hands. Okay, that's good. And we'll just give it about 20 seconds to update. And we'll have a look at the response to, and I'm going to change that time to three minutely. Um, and I'm going to just tell it now that we're doing an intervention, um, which is over here. Custom event. And it's going to be leg raise, just so we can leg raise. Good, and we can see that there's been very little response to leg raise. We'll just give it another 20 or 30 seconds. I don't find this um, works well, which is why, so that's 20 seconds gone. We can see very little change in 
stroke volume index, in stroke volume or in cardiac index. Again, in the clinical situation, you'd have to say that this patient is not volume responsive. Correct. We'll just give it another, just rest them nicely. Good. The heart rate's dropped. Heart rate has dropped a bit, probably because she's valsalvering a little bit, <laughs> trying to help me keep her legs up. And I think in response to normal valsalva, um, that's a very um, reliable uh, way of bringing down heart rate by just by a couple of beats. So I think, I think the drop in heart rate is just from an increase in preload just from the valsalva. But very unimpressive changes in, 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 um, in hemodynamic parameters. And again, I think in theatre or in ICU or in, in the ED department, again, it's a very well-documented test to look if patients are volume responsive, if you don't have an advanced hemodynamic monitor. Let's look at the effects of a GTN infusion now. So we're going to now induce a state of venodilatation, and let's see how the monitor performs. Um, and again, we're just going to have to bear with each other here because I'm not quite sure how Claire's going to respond to it. But you know, a drug is a drug, and we should expect those changes to occur. So I've made up a 60 mic um, per mole strength of GTN. I've taken 3 milligrams into 50 moles. That's a standard 60 mic concentration. So one mil, um, and one mil an hour is basically 60 mics an hour, which is one mic per minute. So it's quite an easy strength to work with. And if I'm drawing up drugs um, in a rush, I often would uh, draw those drugs to a 60 mic per mole strength. And that's exactly what I've done. So we're going to start off again very slowly. And um, Claire's also hooked up to a 16 gauge peripheral line that I put in first pass for the record, Claire. Um, and let's start the GTN infusion. So we can see we've got passive leg raise. I'm going to just say that passive leg raise, I'm going to change that event to um, uh, custom event to GTN. So GTN. Start. Good. So we can see that our arrow on the screen, if I touch the arrow, that's when our GTN has started. And I'm just going to purge the line. And I'm going to just maybe run 10 or 15 mics per minute of GTN just to get a feel for how Claire responds to this. I've never done this on Claire before. So again, I don't want to compromise safety at all. So we'll just rather start slow and just have a look at that response as we give the drug. And as I said, I what I would expect from running GTN is that we're going to venodilate. That's going to certainly compromise preload. We should see a reduction in stroke volume, a reduction in cardiac index. And if we were looking or measuring stroke volume variation, you'd notice that your stroke, vol your stroke volume variation would, would double, sometimes even triple. So let's have a look at that response now and see what's happening. So I'm on 20 mics per minute now, so it's a fairly gentle dose. We haven't, um, we'll just take it slowly. I'm just not sure that it's primed through, so we'll maybe give another more bolus. And let's see what happens. So already we've got a, just a sense that our cardiac index may be falling down, um, but let's see what it does. You feeling okay, Claire? Okay, so we're running 20 mics per minute of GTN. I've primed the line with about 2 mils. And let's have a look. Just make sure that it is running in. Let's see if we can try get clear into a, a, a compensated state of almost uh, of shock. So heart rate has been unchanged. We've had no significant change in pressure at all there. So we'll just maybe give another mil bolus. And again, often you notice the change in pressure straight away. So we'll just see what the pressure does. And we'll see. So there we're starting to reduce our blood pressure now. Um, 
Heart rate maybe a little bit faster. Pressure's uh, just holding, and I don't want to. We'll just give it another two or three minutes. I think we just have to be a little bit. He's uh, working well. That's good. Oops. as it was. Okay, good. And now we can see that our heart rate has gone up. We can see our blood pressure is coming down. I mean, I've got a little bit of aramine to rescue if I need to. Um, and let's have a look at our cardiac index and our cardiac um, and our stroke volume. So, so far, no, no impressive changes. But our heart rate, I think Claire's heart rate is compensating at the moment for that drop in cardiac output, which is quite, you know, which is, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, she's tougher than I thought. Let's, um, <laughs> tougher. But we do get a sense that our stroke volume is reducing, as you can see. Cardiac index is compensating because heart rate has gone up, but we can definitely see that there's been a reduction in our stroke volume and stroke volume index um, as, as, as we are being, a, being a dilating. Um, so we've got a lot of pressure to play with here, which is good. It's quite nice for me as just the facilitator. Um, and again, we'll just maybe go up to 25 marks of GTN per minute. And just another half a more bolus. And let's see what happens. Check for connections. It's definitely working, it's definitely connected, so we are delivering the drug, which is good. And uh, so, not an impressive change, I think. Um, Maybe give another bolus. We've got a lot of pressure to play with. And it is a very dilute strength. So I'd rather just... Uh... Have you got a headache yet, Claire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no. I did feel something before, though, when heart rate went up. Just give it another minute or two. So pressure really still unchanged. Quite interesting. There's a quite a there's a fair amount of GTN running now. I'm, I'm quite amazed at that compensation myself. In animal models, um, you get much more. Um, the changes are a lot more impressive and a lot more. Um, are they the yeah. animals anesthetized? Yeah, fully yeah, anesthetized. So yeah. They wouldn't have as much. Yeah, yeah correct. Mm. Yeah, correct. That's okay. So we on. I'm still going to stay on 30. Or we'll go up to maybe 30 mics just to. Okay. Let's see if we can just try to get that pressure down to maybe 110. see if we can so no significant change is quite interesting and um, not 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 too unexpected so maybe into the 120s now clear so you're still very safe <coughs> just maybe make sure it's running in It's a heart rate definitely changing. In fact, our cardiac index is going up. You can see how rate responsive cardiac index and output is in, in you know in, in healthy subjects. Um, we actually have an increase in cardiac index, and that's why I think you know particularly in young fit patients, it's a good demonstration how despite normal pressures. 
um, you can often be, um, you know, you can often have a very abnormal state, but very normal numbers. Remember, pressure isn't pressure isn't flow. Um, but despite us measuring flow, we're not the, we're not able to demonstrate any change in flow. In fact, we've got an increase in cardiac index, which is which is interesting. The pressure is a little bit on the lower side now. Let's just ride that through and just see what happens to cardiac index. And it's just amazing how that heart rate has compensated index. Um, yeah. yeah. Correct. Okay, so we've now maybe had a 30% change in pressure, but no change in flow, which is quite interesting as well. Uh, let's see if, so no change at all, our stroke volume's actually gone up. Um, I don't want to run much more than 40 marks per minute. You feeling all right, Claire? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So we've had a change in pressure in response, but no significant changes in. I think our index maybe now have, maybe now is sort of beyond that point of being able to compensate. Let's just give it another minute or two, and then and then we're going to have a look at the effects of, of of vasoconstrictor in the in the context of someone who's quite venodilated. Um, Again, that stroke volume index, I think, is coming down a little bit. And I think now we sort of, what I call, this is the tipping point, um, which you see quite commonly, is that you get to a point where compensation fails. And, um, um, and sometimes, um, particularly if I'm running, let's say, noradrenaline, I often find that my pressure is very normal but my cardiac index starts falling and that's when I know that I'm probably using too much vasoconstrictor and probably I'm a bit too undervolumed or not volume resuscitated enough. So now we have um, relative hypotension for Claire, uh, 90 Claire, so you're very safe. Um, heart rate has gone up significantly, but we've interestingly had no significant changes in our flow base parameters and uh, it is what it is. Um, So we're still sitting with a systolic of 90. And again, it is a very low dose infusion. Again, I just really want to keep it a bit, a bit conservative. So I don't, think we, I don't think we're seeing any significant changes. I, I, I suspect if we continued this for a few minutes, our cardiac index would start falling, there's no doubt. Um, and the pressure would continue to fall as well. Um, and despite a MAP of 56, she's obviously still able to deliver enough oxygen I'm sure if we were measuring central um, or mixed venous sats now, that'd probably be fairly normal as well, because with that kind of flow, that kind of index or output, um, I wouldn't expect oxygen delivery to be compromised at all. Any thoughts or comments before we move on? This is analogous to warm shock or septic Yeah, state, exactly, exactly right. Cardiac index yeah. is high, correct. but the blood pressure is dropping down. Correct, so correct. Correct, correct. And I think that's key as well. You've made a very good point because this is what's happening. And, and even when we're looking at, um, at, 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 oc at oxygen delivery, looking at, uh, and we measure and we, we, we can calculate oxygen delivery, what's happening at a microcirculatory level, I think, is, is also a complete different question. But now we can clearly see that the index appears to be falling down. Our stroke volume index is falling. Our chronic in index, I just get the sense that it is falling. Um, her pressure's holding at 92. We'll maybe give another more bolus just to see if we can. Now, if we were, if, if, if Claire was being positively pressure ventilated and we were measuring stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation, it would be going up. And that is very difficult to demonstrate here because she's not anaesthetized. Um, but in the context of a very high stroke volume variation, a cardiac index that's falling down, and uh, either blood loss or a venodilated state, Claire would respond in two ways. She would respond um, to fluid intervention or she'd respond to vasoconstrictor. I'm gonna use vasoconstrictor first just to have a look at the effects of vasoconstriction. We'll just give another, and we can finally see now that, um, 
that um, the pressure's holding remarkably well. Heart rate is sort of stabilized, um, and that trend, I think, would continue at 40 marks per minute of GTN. It's a fairly reasonable dose of GTN. Um, we'll just see if we can maybe just get into the mid-80s. Uh, Claire's got a normal blood pressure of about 100 generally, so that's still pretty safe for her. And we can see that our index, again, I think is generally going to be starting to fall. And I'm going to stop that part of the experiment over there. So I'm going to push stop. Good. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at the effects of vasoconstriction. So that you can either you know, phenylephrine um, is often our preferred choice, nor drill if we have a central line. <coughs> I'm just using Aramine now because it's quite easy to, to titrate. So we can see the pressures now in the high 80s. Um, you feeling all right, Claire? Beautiful. And we'll just have a look at what's going to happen to just give it 30 seconds and then we'll um, do the next intervention, which is going to be vasoconstrictor. So I'm going to just plug into the machine vasopressor and that's where we're going to start the vasopressor infusion, which is over there, which is the green arrow. So not, a, not an impressive fall in, in, um, in stroke volume, but if you have a look at our percentage change, we've, um, we've got a change of 10% um, um, for our stroke volume index, and we've got a, only about a 5% change of our cardiac index, um, and a 10% change in stroke volume. So the machine actually will quantify that percentage change as well. Okay, let's have a look at the effects now of vena of, of vasoconstriction and again what I would expect because Claire is preload responsive and that's why I've run the GTN first is because she's preload responsive if she wasn't preload responsive we wouldn't see the effects um, of increasing cardiac index or output with a vasoconstrictor in the context of a patient that's not preload responsive from our own work and from my understanding of the literature what we would find is despite our blood pressure going up because that's what happens in the context of a vasoconstrictor, our cardiac index actually starts falling down because there's just such increased afterload that the index starts falling. But in the context of someone who's preload responsive, I find that the cardiac index actually goes up even further. So now we are in a nice state now. We've really changed Claire's index. It's, it, it's fallen quite significantly. And this is a good time to now give a small amount of aramine and have a look at the response to that. So again, I'm going to take the GTN off. We've really had a significant fall in stroke volume index and stroke volume. As expected, our cardiac index is halved. So that is the effects of GTN. So that's relative, relative hypervolemia. Um, let's give, and again, this is just a straightforward strength. It's a 50, it's a 500 mic per mil solution. We're just going to give one mil. I'm going to flush that through. And again, we're going to have a look at the effects now of vasoconstriction. And again, we'll first see the blood pressure should start going up. And I'll take it up to about 140, 150, maybe even 160. Um, and with that increase in pressure, the, we're going to see what happens to, to flow. So heart rates come down. That means the aramine's on board. Um, but we've had a definite change in, and we can see now our blood pressure has significantly increased. Again, no hidden surprises. We've given a vasoconstrictor. Our blood pressure is up to 150, 154. Heart rate's right down to 50. Now, you would expect with that increased um, afterload, cardiac index actually should reduce. But what we should find is that our cardiac index will start increasing. And the mechanism of that increase in preload is the increase in splanchnic vessels um, uh, um, venoconstricting. Uh, and that splanchnic venoconstriction increases blood into the, um, it, to the right heart. So essentially it's the same as a pressure load. So we've got a fairly um, low index now. And let's have a look and just give it another 20 or 30 seconds just to see what it does. Um, Maybe just give another half a mil. And again, we should again, if 
declare was not preload responsive, I would expect that index not to change, uh, but the pressure to often go very high. And that's the key for me in theatre when I know that I'm maybe running too much um, vasoconstriction. So again, we should expect to see an increase in cardiac index, in cardiac output, and particularly in stroke volume index in response to that vena constriction now. And those effects can be achieved as impressively with a volume intervention. So we've got a nice good pressure, and now we can see our cardiac index in response to that pressure is, so look at that change in stroke volume. We've had a 35% change in stroke volume, or stroke volume index, despite the cardiac index not changing too much. And again, that's why a stroke volume is a very accurate way of, of, of ascertaining the response to a variety of different interventions. We can see now stroke volume is really, um, I'll just change the scale. Um, uh, the scales, let's just make it 200. Okay, good, and again, we can see that significant increase in, so 131% increase in stroke volume in response to a vasoconstrictor. And that is, that's the point that I was trying to drive home. Now, in the state of venodilatation or hemorrhage, the exact same effects can be achieved with fluid intervention you see the exact same changes physiologically. And now we can see that our stroke volume is actually, you can see how impressive that increase in preload is because we, um, we, we have now um, increased our stroke volume by, um, you know, by, by almost uh, 150%. And that is why in theater, if my stroke volume variation is high, that means my patient is preload responsive, but my patient's not bleeding, and there's no occult bleeding, and my patient's hypotensive, I often will manage that with a very low-dose vasoconstrictor infusion, because that normalizes my flow parameters, as we can see beautifully, demonstrated beautifully there, without the need for unnecessary fluid intervention. And again, from the work that we're doing in our department, we're quite concerned about unnecessary fluid intervention. Um, so again, that beautifully demonstrates how we've returned Claire's cardiac output. You, Claire, you feeling all right? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so just uh, change the scales again. Uh, 100. Just to, and we can see beautifully how now we've corrected that state using a vasoconstrictor. So cardiac index is back to normal. Stroke volume is, we've, we've, we've overcorrected that stroke volume and our heart rate is stabilizing and that pressure is stabilizing as well. What I want to do now is I want to try run a bit more GTN just to try um, show you that we can achieve the same hemodynamic effects with a fluid bolus intervention. So that's quite impressive for me, you know, just seeing that now in a healthy volunteer. That sort of reinforces what I've what I thought would happen. Any comments based on what we've seen now? A couple of times you mentioned there were some clues that would indicate that you, you're running a little bit too much press or and you need to do some volume. Can Correct. You run through that again? Absolutely. And I, I call that the tipping point. Um, when you get to the point where despite your pressure going up, your cardiac index starts falling, the effects of an increase afterload on the left ventricle actually, actually hamper cardiac index and hamper flow. Um, and I find that very commonly, and I've got beautiful slides demonstrating that where in response to aramine or phenylephrine or noradrenaline, your pressure goes from whatever, let's say you're hypertensive at 80, it goes to 160. You think, wow, my pressure's fantastic. But when you look at flow, your index actually has halved. And then I know, I think, well, is that the right intervention? And the answer is always no. And my hemodynamic state that I've misassessed is often that of hypervolemia. And often then I would, um, I, would, I would treat my stroke volume responsiveness or my volume responsiveness states with, uh, with, with being a little bit more aggressive with my fluid intervention. Um, so I call that the tipping point. Um, good. Let's just check that the artery is good. If you just, um, just don't want to have arterial on. I just may just flush that through. You comfy, Claire? 
Beautiful. Okay, good. So let's go back to the GTN. And um, I'm going to restart it again. Oh, yeah, good. And again, we're gonna, I'm going to tell the, the monitor that I'm going to start GTN again. So GTN, and that's going to be started. Just so I've got an event, because we obviously downloading all this data. And I'll just, again, prime the line. So we've really returned to Claire's baseline normal hemodynamic state. We'll just see if we can maybe replicate um, that degree of vena dilatation. So I'm going to just keep it at 40 mics per minute of GTN. And let's just have a look what happens again. Um, I don't know how long the aramine really takes to wear off what its context sensitive half life is, but again, we should hopefully see some changes in, in both heart rate and blood pressure with reciprocal changes at our flow base parameters. So I'll just prime that through again. So heart rate, maybe just trending on the upside. Pressure again should start coming, start to come down. And again, we should see the same changes, um, a reduction in stroke volume index, and eventually in cardiac index as well. Um, and what's impressed me most today is how well the cardiac output compensates in response to heart rate. And I think, um, and that's the and that's the concept of one of the adverse effects of beta blocking patients is that you take away that normal ability to compensate, particularly in, in situations where that's required. So heart rate's gone up quite significantly. Um, we should start seeing, and as we're seeing already now, a, a reciprocal reduction in stroke volume index. We've still got a bit of pressure to play with, so I'm just going to give another uh, mil and a half bolus. And again, we just should get back to the state that we were. And certainly if we waited long enough, and I'm actually running out of the GTN infusion now, um, then, um, so we'll just give that another minute or so to see what happens to the pressure. Lots of pressure to play with. Heart rate certainly compensated well. Um, again, not, not too much changes in terms of our stroke volume. Infusion is finished. Wow, never got through a full syringe of GTN before. <laughs> Let's just see if there's any change there. We don't seem to be making any changes at all there. Let's give it another. Just give it another 30 seconds. Hasn't even, hasn't even touched the blood pressure. And certainly no significant changes. And again, I think it took us a good seven or eight minutes just to get Claire's cardiac index to half with a, again, with a change in her stroke volume index as well. So maybe we just haven't given it enough time. Um, let's just see what it does in 20 seconds time. Um, and then again, I may go back to passive leg raise just to have a look at the effects of passive leg raise now, just to see if there is a clinically important change in simple um, passive leg raise, because we've already done um, um, vasoconstriction. Um, instead of giving her um, 500 mils of fluid, which will take maybe five or 10 minutes um, before we see a clinical effect, we'll just see if we can replicate that effect by a quick a quick passive leg raise. So we really haven't changed stroke volume much at all. Um, you just relax, clear. I'm going to just lift your legs up. So just let them be very heavy. We'll just see what happens. We'll just give it about a minute. Just to see what the response is now. It's 
maybe the heart rate's coming down a little bit, hard to say. But I don't suspect we're going to see any, 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 any changes that are, that are too significant clinically. So not much change at all. Let's put it down. Okay, good. But again, if patients were fluid responsive, again, you should see a quite uh, significant response to that um, fluid intervention. Let's move on um, and um, take out some, um, I'm going to use dopamine here for two reasons. One, it's a very good inotrope and it's a very good chronotrope and um, it's safe, generally in fairly low doses. Um, we have full ECG monitoring, so in the context of arrhythmias, obviously I'll, I'll, I'll stop it fairly quickly. But again, I just want to keep it conservative and, um, and have a look at the physiological response, but not stress Claire's heart uh, um, to its maximum. Good. And again, I've specifically run it like so. So our pressure is settling down now, 115. We've got an index that's settling back down as well. This is all intentional. That's why I didn't want to give too much fluid now. Um, that's probably still a response to our, our, our GTN that's probably still on board. Um, stroke volume index is quite significantly down. If we have a look at a percentage change, you know, it's down 20%. That's a significant change, 20%. I'm going to hook up some dopamine. Um, do, does anyone use dopamine in their practice um, at all? Um, in, in any specific scenarios that you have a preference for dopamine? Okay. 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 <laughs> Outside cardiac surgery. So um, I must say, and again, I'll present some of this data tomorrow. In about 20% of our complex um, pancreatic resection work, um, particularly in the patients over the above, over the age of 70 or 80, um, having very complex um, pancreatic resections, often with portal vein and SMA reconstructions as well. Um, I find that my baseline hemodynamic state, particularly in the elderly patients, is one of low contractility. And because I run Remy and DARES generally, because we air fast track and extubate all these patients, I find my heart rate is quite low generally. And I do find that I'm running um, dopamine on about 20%, 20% of those patients, um, because that's the hemodynamic state that is in front of me. And when I see you, um, say to me, why are you running dopamine? I tell them, because my heart rate is slow and my cardiac index is, 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 is very low and my patient's not volume responsive. And they say, okay, thank you, I understand now. But again, if you're running these drugs without advanced monitors, um, again, I think you have to be a lot more careful and a lot more cautious. Let's have a look at the effects now of, of dopamine. Um, um, I don't like adrenaline at all for a couple of reasons. One, um, it causes quite significant tachyarrhythmias or even tachycardia, number one. Um, I, um, I don't like that. Um, also, I don't need vasoconstriction because, if you, because we, um, we actually measure our systemic vascular resistance and there's no problem at all with, with, with that of a low SVR state. Three is adrenaline really throws your patients by chemical inflammation haywire, particularly sugar levels, and often for our uh, complex, uh, complete pancreatectomy work, um, it just really makes our management of sugar very difficult. And thirdly, particularly for our liver resections, when we use it, where we use lactate as a marker of how well that liver is doing, or uh, as a marker of illness severity, we get what's called the type two lactic acidosis with adrenaline. So for, for those four or five reasons, my preference is uh, I don't like adrenaline at all. In cardiac, different story, but I'd like to keep this not cardiac um, specific at the moment. Um, dopamine, again, has no effects on systemic vascular resistance. It does cause tachyarrhythmias if you use it in, 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 in too high doses, and I, I limit my, my doses to about one to maybe two mics per kilo per minute for those that are familiar with dopamine. What I've done now for those that, um, I'm going to just get that up and running, um, and we're going to, good, that's running nicely now. I'm going to tell the um, machine now that we are our custom event, and we're going to run some dopamine. So I'll put dopamine.
and you'll see how quickly Claire will become tachycardic with dopamine. And that's dopamine and that's custom event over there. So we can see that's where we started our dopamine. What I'm going to do again is I'm going to just maybe bolus and we'll know when the bolus is hit because... The iron line's just over there. Oh, you thank you. No, good. Yeah. Just give it a flush. Beautiful. Thank you. And again, you can see how important it is to have a reliable arterial waveform trace. And that's why for our complex work, I do put in long lines. Not brachial, but often radial. So I'm taking femoral lines um, and I use our 20 gauges because they're a bit smaller. Um, and wire exchange them um, through just a normal simple line that I've done here. And I thought of doing that for Claire. There's probably a maybe um, you know, probably a non-significant incidence of uh, of increased thrombosis. Um, we, we've never had an incident at Austin, but then you're really monitoring central circulation. It's a beautiful waveform. It never kinks um, because it's measuring it up here, and it's as good as having an arterial line, a brachial waveform trace. Really good. So what we've done now is we've started um, dopamine. Now I'm going to start it at about um, 2 mics per kilo per minute. And we'll just again have a look at what happens in response to chronotropy and inotropy. And again, the textbooks will tell you that the heart rate should go up. Contractility should increase. So we should have an increase in stroke volume index and certainly a noticeable increase in cardiac index as well. Check for disconnections, that's good. Make sure it's flushing in. I'll just prime that line again. Okay, and already since the dopamine's been started, which was over there, at that point over there, we can see that we've had a 35% increase in cardiac index and output on very low dose dopamine. So now I'm running it at about 0 0.25, 0 0.3 mics per kilo per minute. I would never run it uh, as aggressively in theatre. We can see how quickly these patients become tachycardic. And that's, again, if you're running adrenaline, and I've tried it many times, the, um, the amount of, and now we can see we've got a, a significant tachycardia now, of 100. And look at our cardiac index. It should, again, continue to climb. Sorry? No, okay, good. So we'll just stop that. Tears not feeling good. But again, we've demonstrated um, heart rate's only 105, but blood pressure's gone up significantly. And have a look what's happening to our flow based parameters, as expected. This is not a surprise to me at all. It's reliable all the time. But we, we've, we've, um, we've certainly had a significant increase in stroke volume index and, and particularly in cardiac index as well. And for, our, as I said, our, our, a lot of our patients with underlying cardiac dysfunction, where you c connect them to a flow-directed monitor, and you often surprisingly find that despite a normal pressure, the cardiac index is very low. So again, you can just see the effects of dopamine there. Uh, how are you feeling? You feeling all right? Yeah. Okay, good. Done. So pressure's good. Heart rate's 116 tests. That's why you may be... Okay. Just let that settle down definitely stopped and it's off. Okay, so we didn't have to run a lot of dopamine to demonstrate um, the body's response to, um, to um, inotropy and chronotropy. Um, and again, um, that'll, start, um, that'll start coming down very quickly now. We'll just let the, uh, I just give Claire a little bit of fluid, just in case she is a little bit um, deplete from last night. <laughs> but you can see how that heart rate is quite sustained at 120, um, and it's a pity I didn't bring any metoprolol or any esmolol because we could have really just made clear feel one a bit better and, and just corrected that. Um, <laughs> okay, good, and that's now, I, yeah, I, I, I think we've hit the peak. Um, I'm feeling better, it's okay. No, good. I mean, Claire tells me she's not feeling well. She's, she's, she's very good with. So again, quite a, um, um, and you can see why patients that get stressed, um, why, why their, their, their oxygen demands increase. It's not unusual that um, 
It's a very diagnostic test <coughs> for, um, for, for ischemia. Okay. That should start to see this. The heart rate is coming down clear, which is good. So again, let's just summarize sort of what we've done. And again, that's a quite an impressive increase in cardiac index and output just in response to very low dose dopamine. And that's only at about point, you know, for, as I said, that's about 0.3. So that's, that, that's, in a reason, that's a reasonable amount of dopamine. Um, I would never run it more than 0.15 to 0.2 marks per kilo per minute in theatre. Um, so again, just to recap, we can see how reliable our advanced monitors are. You know, in healthy volunteers, um, in the absence of severe vasoplegia, um, I find that all our advanced monitors, from our PICA monitors to particularly our flow tracks um, and in PA catheters in selected patients in cardiac, give us additional information which allow us to make much better hemodynamic decisions. Heart rate's coming down. And certainly for our complex high-risk cases now, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of ubiquitous practice in our institution, again, to at least consider an advanced monitor for the very reasons that we've outlined this morning. Um, I think if we put Claire on the bicycle... She may fall off number one, um, which would be really good for the cameras because she's already held up her left arm for everyone to see. If she fell off, I'd have something to uh, tease her about in, in months to come. Um, but the physiological response on the bicycle would be identical. Often the heart rate would be a little bit higher. We get Claire's heart rate to 150, 160. And again, you'd see that sympathetic overdrive take over with the same changes as, as we see here, an increase in cardiac index, an increase in stroke volume index. So I think um, that has been probably an hour. I've probably over exceeded. So Roger, thank you for uh, giving me a little bit of extra time. Again, I really want to thank the Edwards crew just for allowing this to happen for, for SMAC. So thank you again to, to all the support um, personnel that have really just made this happen. And again, I really Eau Claire, big time <laughs> for um, just for. Uh, uh, so. All right, so I, so I think we'll close it at that. I, I'm certainly will hang around just whilst I continue to resuscitate Claire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if there's any questions, certainly feel free to um, drop by or send me an email or, or Roger, uh, and certainly we'll put you in contact with with myself.